AFBE's work really focuses on three key areas. The first one being leading improvements in agri-food industry. The next one being protecting animal, plant and human health. And then the third one um, being enhancing the natural and marine environments. So of course, air quality very much fits within that third area, which is by no means the third, um, of enhancing the natural and marine environments. So air quality is very important to the well-being of our whole society. And indeed, our society's activities and behaviours contribute significantly, on the other hand, to air quality. So, you know, our activities contribute to the levels of sulfur dioxide and volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere. But equally, agriculture does play a significant role in our local air quality as well. And those key gases um, that are of concern from an agricultural perspective are namely ammonia on one hand, and then greenhouse gases on the other hand, and within the greenhouse gas family, specifically methane and nitrous oxide. But thankfully, um, and a lot of this research is funded by the Department of Agriculture, AFBE have two major programmes of work in these areas. And this morning, I'm delighted that Dr. John McElroy will present his work on ammonia emissions and key mitigations to address those and their impact on our natural habitats. And then that will be followed by Dr. Dario Fernara. And Dario is a world leading expert in the area of soil carbon sequestration. So we'll hear some insights from Dario in that area of work. Each presentation will last about 20 minutes. And after each presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So hopefully you have familiarized yourself with WebEx and down the bottom of your screen, you should see some icons. One of those icons will have three dots on it. If you click on that, it should appear um, for you to be able to select Q&A. So if you wish, you can then type your question into the appropriate box, probably to the right hand side of your screen and type your question in and send it to all panelists. So it's important to send it to all panelists so that myself and Dario and John can see those questions. Um, otherwise, we may not see them and miss your question. So hopefully that's clear and hopefully you'll be able to navigate that. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John McElroy. Now, John um, is leading uh, the major programme, as I say, in ammonia emissions and in, you know, the impact of mitigations for ammonia on our the emissions from livestock production, as well as their impact on natural sensitive habitats. So this morning, John is going to show us some results from modeling work that has been undertaken in that program of work, and as I say, how much um, emissions we can actually reduce through mitigations and the resultant impact on the favorable status of our sensitive habitats. So John, thank you very much. Over to you. Well, uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Elizabeth, um, and thanks to everyone for tuning in this morning. So as Elizabeth has already outlined, the first of today's presentations will focus on the topic of air quality challenges in Northern Ireland agriculture, and in particular, the causes and impacts of nitrogen emissions from agricultural systems. So as I'm sure we're all aware, um, nitrogen is a fundamental nutrient in agriculture. However, agriculture incurs losses of nitrogen to both air and water. Increasing our nitrogen use efficiency and reducing losses of nitrogen to the environment will result in more efficient, more profitable, and more sustainable agricultural systems. Nitrous oxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitric oxide, and ammonia are the principal nitrogen containing compounds which are emitted to the atmosphere by agricultural activities. Ammonia and nitrous oxide, in particular, are overwhelmingly agricultural in origin, with agriculture contributing 88 and 68 percent, respectively, of total annual UK emissions of these gases. Nitrous oxide is 298 carbon, carbon dioxide equivalents, so it's a very powerful greenhouse gas uh, which contributes to anthropogenic global warming. Now, while nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas and it doesn't contribute directly to nitrogen deposition, there is evidence to suggest that nitrogen deposition through other forms of deposited nitrogen actually increases nitrous oxide emissions from soils, particularly from soils in semi natural habitats. Now, nit nitrogen compounds are deposited from the atmosphere. And contribute to the eutrophication or the nitrogen enrichment of the semi natural landscape, which leads to a reduction in biodiversity and can contribute to the formation of particulate matter or PM, which has detrimental effects on human health. 
agricultural ammonia and ammonium, which is derived from agricultural ammonia, are the largest contributors to nitrogen deposition, not only across Northern Ireland, but also across the UK and across Europe as a whole. Now, it's estimated that 98% of terrestrial priority habitats in Northern Ireland actually exceed their critical loads of deposited nitrogen. And these priority habitats are protected by the National Emission Ceiling Directive and by the Habitats Directive. The Gothenburg Protocol and the UK Air Quality Strategy require the UK to reduce its ammonia emissions by 8% relative to the 2005 baseline by 2020 and by 16% by 2030. Now, as we'll see in the next slide, the UK is actually on an upward trajectory um, and it's not likely the 2020 target will be met. So in Northern Ireland, the ammonia issue is actually more acute than in the UK as a whole, with 12% of UK emissions of ammonia coming from Northern Ireland, which is only 6% of the land area. However, ammonia emissions in Northern Ireland are in line with higher livestock outputs per unit of land area here. Now on the left, we can see the trends in UK air pollution, pollution emissions since 1970. All of the major air pollutants have seen a significant decline since 1970, and in particular since the mid-90s. However, as you can see, ammonia follows a very different trend, um, having seen a decline from the late 90s in tw until 2010. However, since 2010, there's been a steady increase. On the right-hand side here, we can see the Northern Ireland-specific trend relative to the UK-wide trend. Um, and the Northern Ireland trend here is driven by increases in cattle, pig, and poultry numbers, and a more recent increase in nitrogen fertilizer use. So what is the impact of ammonia? Well, Firstly, up to 40% of the total nitrogen in livestock manure could potentially be lost as ammonia under typical Northern Ireland manure management practices with no, with no ammonia abatement measures in place. And this is a significant loss, a uh, significant financial loss to the farmer, which could equate up to £9,000 in lost nitrogen for a 300 cow dairy herd per annum. Now, emitted ammonia is largely deposited locally with significant effects on the biodiversity of priority habitats close to the emission source. However, a proportion of the emitted ammonia converts to ammonium aerosols, which are transported much larger distances and can contribute even to transboundary air pollution. It's estimated that ammonium nitrate, which is a secondary compound derived from the reaction in the atmosphere between ammonia and nitric acid, could actually be responsible for 10 to 20 percent of particulate matter, uh, with significantly higher contributions episodically, potentially coinciding with high ammonia emission periods um, and warm weather conditions. A particulate matter is a significant contributor to respiratory and other health problems. In terms of costs, well, the European Nitrogen Assessment estimates that the damage costs of ammonia to human health and biodiversity across Europe are in the range of 75, year, 70, uh, 75 to 485 billion euro per annum. And this equates to 4 to 30 euro per kilo of ammonia emitted, or sorry, per, per kilo of nitrogen emitted for human health um, and biodiversity related to SADA costs combined. In the UK, a recent Royal Society report estimates that the damage to biodiversity and health in the UK is somewhere between two and 56 pounds per kilo of ammonia emitted, with an annual cost estimated at 700 million, but with significant uncertainties ranging from 590 million to 16 billion. Now, the EU maximum technically feasible reduction in emissions is estimated to cost approximately two billion euro per annum, which is approximately two euro per kilo of ammonia abated. And this is in fact substantially lower than the cost to both human health and biodiversity. And the cost of mitigation should also reduce, reduce with the technological refinement over time. So the UK and use animal numbers data and apply emission factors uh, for on farm management practices. So really it's fundamental for us to fine tune both the activity data and the emission factors to better inform the models. So AFBI have been leading on Northern Ireland specific ammonia research to refine our calculations of regional ammonia emissions within the wider UK context. We've been determining specific emission factors for typical Northern Ireland livestock management practices, which aren't currently reflected in the inventory. So this is a key component of the ongoing AFBI ammonia research. Now, in collaboration with the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, we've also been monitoring the spatial variability in ammonia concentrations across Northern Ireland. So we've established uh, 28 new ammonia monitoring sites across Northern Ireland, as you can see on the right-hand side. And these are in addition to the, the three long-term sites, um, which have been monitoring ammonia concentrations in Northern Ireland since the mid-90s. And the, the, the objective here is to more rigorously ground truth and validate uh, ammonia modelling outputs and to increase the stakeholder trust in the models. Now, to date, um, we've collected nine months of data from the network, and there's a good agreement between the modelled and measured ammonia concentrations regionally. 
albeit we really need to capture at least a year before we can fully validate, validate uh, the modeled outputs gathered by uh, using the data gathered by the network. So building this accurate baseline um, of our current mission process, uh, profile is fundamental also in order to measure and recognize future progress in ammonia abatement as we move forward. By estimating ammonia emissions and the subsequent environmental impacts when, when nitrogen is deposited the land requires the development of, of a multidisciplinary research approach with input from a spectrum of research fields. Um, so animal scientists are fundamental here because they determine livestock nitrogen excretion and the effects of, for example, dietary crude protein reduction and genetic improvements in reducing the, the, the nitrogen excre excreted by livestock. And this is a fundamental process for reducing emissions from sub subsequent stages in manure management. Agri-environmental scientists like myself then consider the emissions of ammonia from excreted nitrogen through manure management um, and following, for example, application to land. And we use the likes of uh, nitrogen flow models, such as the National Inventory NARCES model, uh, to, to, to model this flow of nitrogen. We also develop emission factors for housing systems and manure management practices, and also reduction factors for the mitigation strategies applied. Agricultural economists are very important too, because they have to determine the cost effectiveness of the mitigation strategies and express this through the use of economic tools, uh, for example, margin of the cost curves. Atmospheric scientists consider the dispersion and the distribution of emitted ammonia, so where the ammonia actually goes uh, whenever it's emitted from the agricultural systems, with the aim of understanding not only the spatial variation in ammonia concentrations, but also spatial variation in nitrogen deposition and when that ammonia is, is deposited to land. Finally, then, ecologists have to consider the effects on biodiversity of the deposited nitrogen and determine the critical loads of nitrogen to which organisms uh, may be exposed without incurring damage. So this holistic approach between researchers from these backgrounds is really fundamental to provide the full evidence base for policymakers. And this has required international collaborative research between AFPI and other research institutes, um, including national ammonia industry partners, Rothamsted Research, and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Now, in collaboration with these research partners, the NARCES National Ammonia Inventory Model was used to simulate the application of ammonia reduction strategies across Northern Ireland agriculture. Um, the suite of ammonia reduction strategies modelled included extended grazing, uh, the application of stabilised urea, lower crude protein diets across all livestock sectors, genetic improvement in livestock to reduce the nitrogen excretion, the, the move towards low emission slurry spreading with the uptake of trailing hose and trailing shoe, washing down of collecting yards. Um, the, the, the application of, of novel housing floor systems, which have the capacity to reduce ammonia emissions from housing, and also the, 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 the applying of slurry store covers to our outdoor stores. So these interventions in the scenario that we modeled could be considered, I suppose, representative of a Northern Ireland specific technically feasible reduction scenario using existing and validated ammonia reduction strategies and uptake rates, which are potentially achievable within five to 10 years. So as you can see on the right hand side here, um, applying the suite of national ammonia reduction measures results in a 25% reduction in agricultural ammonia emissions across Northern Ireland. But what does this reduction in regional ammonia do to ameliorate ammonia concentrations and nitrogen deposition at priority habitats? So to answer this, the NARCES model output, as you've seen previously, and it's on the left hand side again in this slide, this is taken through a series of emission and atmospheric dispersion models which encompass not only the spatial distribution of ammonia emissions, but also of other nitrogen pollutants, including estimates of oxides of nitrogen from other sectors, for example, transport and industry, as well as estimates of transboundary nitrogen inputs. So, so modeling suggests that the 25% reduction in, in ammonia emissions across Northern Ireland results in two special areas of conservation out of 53, and 14 areas of special scientific interest out of 188 being brought out of exceedance of the one microgram ammonia per meter cubed critical level. Now, whilst this may seem underwhelming, this was not a surprise given the levels of exceedance at the priority sites under the baseline scenario. However, whilst only a small number of sites may be returned to favorable status, the 25% reduction in ammonia actually achieves significant improvements in nitrogen deposition at all of Northern Ireland's protected sites. Now, we know that ammonia is a very highly reactive gas which deposits the ground rapidly, making it principally a local scale pollutant. And it's estimated that 60 to 70 percent of emitted ammonia would be deposited with one, within one kilometre of the source of the emission source. And the vast majority of this will be within the first few hundred metres. Now, dispersion is, of course, influenced strongly by environmental conditions, for example, wind speed, um, uh, temperature, etc. A proportion of the emitted ammonia will interact with other atmospheric components, 
and will form ammonium aerosols. And these are much more stable compounds, they're less reactive, and they can travel much larger distances and be deposited much further away through, for example, rainfall. So knowing this, logically, I suppose the spatial targeting of ammonia abatement strategies in the vicinity of designated sites should be more effective per unit of emission saved. And to gauge how beneficial this could be for nitrogen deposition reduction across Northern Ireland's designated sites, enhanced mitigation measures were applied in nitrogen reduction zones, or NRZs, of one kilometre, two kilometre, and five kilometre around designated sites. And these enhanced mitigation measures were similar to those applied across Northern Ireland, but with more ambitious uptake rates. And on the right hand side here, we can just see an example of these one, two, and five K buffers around a, a special area of conservation in, in Northern Ireland. So in terms of reductions in ammonia concentrations at designated sites, as we can see in the top chart here, spatial targeting in a one kilometer nitrogen reduction zone is roughly four times more effective than non-targeted mitigation per unit of emission reduction. Now, in terms of total nitrogen deposition, which we can see here in the bottom chart, spatial targeting in a one kilometer nitrogen reduction zone is 2.5 times more effective than non-targeted mitigation, again, per unit of emission reduction. Now, the difference in effectiveness of spatial targeting on ammonia concentrations or the critical levels and nitrogen deposition critical loads is related to the fact that ammonia concentrations would be largely from the locally derived sources upon which the spatially targeted abatement strategies will have achieved significant reduction emissions, uh, while the nitrogen deposition includes, of course, other forms of nitrogen inputs such as ammonium aerosols, oxides of nitrogen, which can be derived from much further afield and upon which the, the local nitrogen reduction zone interventions um, would have less of an impact on. So overall, the enhanced mitigation measures in the nitrogen reduction zones result in one further special area of conservation and five more areas of special scientific interest being brought below exceedance levels. Now, the makeup of nitrogen inputs to desi designated sites across Northern Ireland is hugely variable, and therefore the effectiveness of spatial targeting um, of ammonia reduction measures will not be the same at each site. So in general, this is being very general, just to give you an idea of the, the, some of the sites that we have in Northern Ireland. Sites located in close proximity to intensive agricultural land use, so, so for example, lowland bogs, respond very well to spatial targeting, as dry deposited ammonia, ammonia coming from local sources, would be the predominant form of nitrogen input to these sites. So here, the spatial targeting of abatement strategies can significantly re reduce the local uh, ammonia sources and consequently uh, the nitrogen deposition and the, the ammonia concentrations of the sites. For sites that are further away from intensive agricultural land use, for example, some of the Moor mountain sites, the spatial targeting of ammonia abatement strategies is less effective, as nitrogen deposition in these sites is generally dominated by the longer range or the background nitrogen sources, such as the wet deposited ammonium aerosols. And um, so significantly reducing these longer range inputs requires really a regional approach to tackle regionally elevated concentrations, um, and in some cases will require the addressing of transboundary long range inputs. Now, whilst this modeling approach that we've used is a very powerful tool at a regional or a national level to look at regionally applied abatement strategies, the resolution is limited to one kilometre grid squares, making it rather coarse at a site-specific level where, for example, point ammonia sources, so for example, a livestock house or a slurry store, uh, which could be located in close proximity to a designated site. Or, for example, if we would wish to, to model sub-one kilometre nitrogen reduction zones. So finer re resolution models would need to be implemented at a site-specific level, in addition to the provision of more accurate site-specific ammonia activity data um, to inform the models and allow us to model ammonia abatement more accurately at the site-specific scale. Now, in terms of the outlook, as we've heard, ammonia is going to be a significant challenge for the agri-food industry in Northern Ireland. Ongoing AFPI research suggests that region-wide ammonia reductions of 25% achievable using existing technologies result in significant reductions in nitrogen deposition albeit returning only a small percentage of designated sites to favourable status. As we've seen, spatial targeting is significantly more cost-effective per unit of emission save and would be practical at certain sites. However, a wider regional approach would also be required to reduce the longer range or the background inputs of nitrogen. Achieving greater reductions in ammonia will require the development of novel ammonia abatement systems for on-farm adoption or, for example, centralised nutrient management systems which need to be developed and validated through experimental research. And these solutions will come from further scientific research into, for example, dietary strategies, slurry treatments, <coughs> agroforestry and tree shelter belts, for example, novel livestock housing systems, and novel slurry land spreading systems. 
would be it would be very good actually to have further evidence surrounding the contribution of ammonia to PM formation at a regional level, um, as would specific Northern Ireland specific estimates of the impact on human health. We also really think I think we need to refine our estimates of the costs of ecosystem damage in Northern Ireland based on regional specific data, considering all of the ecosystem services that these habitats uh, provide, such as for example carbon capture, pollination, flood prevention, climate change mitigation, etc. Whilst also considering the role of our natural landscape and our biodiversity primarily as part of our culture and identity, but also as an attraction to tourism. And finally, then, it's, it's fundamental really to develop, I think, a, a decision support tool for stakeholders, which considers pollution reduction synergies across a range of agri-environmental issues to be implemented either at UK or Northern Ireland wide level. Um, and really, we might need to reinvent the wheel here, as we can see what the Dutch have done through the, the, the ANCA and Urias systems. These are two separate but integrated decision support tools. The prior is a, an annual nutrient cycling assessment for farms, which considers greenhouse gases, air quality, water quality, etc. And the latter then is a cross-sectoral tool for integrated nitrogen management, which considers the contribution of nitrogen deposition and abatement interventions from all sectors, so not only agriculture, but transport and industry. And this creates room for sustainable development across all sectors. So this concludes the presentation. Uh, thanks very much for your attention and participation. And I'm very happy to try to address any, any relevant questions now. Thank you very much, John. Um, that was very interesting. Um, we have a, a couple of questions here. Um, one of them is a, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording these presentations and the plan is to upload them for wider consumption after the, the event. So we'll let you know where you can access the presentations and this webinar as a whole after the event. But um, just a couple of other questions here, John, that have come in. And please, folks, don't be shy about asking questions. Um, the weather state, so we've got 28 sites across Northern Ireland. Um, the question here is, have we got weather stations at each of these sites? So do you want to elaborate just on our discussions um, that we had during that period of setting up the 28 stations? Yeah, so the 28 sites that have been established across Northern Ireland fall into line with the National Ammonia Monitoring Network protocol, and this is a, a UK-wide network, which is in excess of 80 to 90 sites across the UK, of which there were three permanent sites in Northern Ireland. And um, so, so the data from these 20, 28 extra sites feeds into that network. So it's given a higher resolution um, uh, view eff effectively of ammonia concentrations and the variability in ammonia concentrations across Northern Ireland. Now, that model and uh, the model which, which, which takes that data uh, uses UK wide averages uh, for, 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 for weather data, so prevailing wind directions, wind speeds, etc. So that's a, that's for that model, it's applied at a UK wide level. So there's no need for that model to have uh, site specific weather data. Now, where we do have site specific um, environmental monitoring weather data is at a site that we've established at Athby Hillsborough, um, where we have um, a high resolution, a high, free, a high temporal frequency um, ammonia monitoring site, where we're effectively looking at measuring ammonia concentrations on a minute by minute basis. That's opposed to the national monitoring network sites, which have a, a monthly measuring frequency. So at that minute by minute uh, monitoring site, yes, absolutely, we have uh, uh, weather data because it's fundamental to, 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 to understand where ammonia emissions are coming from um, and how the environmental um, variables affect ammonia concentrations. And we're seeing you know, that the effect of environmental variables on ammonia concentration is very strong. Uh, for example, under low wind conditions, uh, we have we tend to have accumulation of ammonia in the vicinity. So ammonia from the, the local Hillsborough farm sources isn't being dispersed. It's staying in the vicinity and it's accumulating and it's given very high concentrations, uh, episodic high peaks of ammonia concentrations. Whereas if, if the wind speed picks up, you can see the ammonia concentrations see the ammonia concentrations drop quite significantly, quite rapidly and dispersed for the field. And so, so absolutely, consideration of, of, of weather um, uh, environmental variables is fundamental uh, to, to understand ammonia. Okay. And we are actually in development of a website for uh, for stakeholders, which will hopefully allude to that. Sure. And, and the, the questions are really flowing in now. So if we don't get them all answered, we will follow up um, individually with you on answers. Um, but a, a bit of a theme maybe in a few of the answers that have come through there so far, John, is around um, the mitigations, you know, is, is that based on 100% compliance of, you know, is your 25% reduction based on 100% compliance? And then wrapped into that as well, you know, the costs, how do, you know, have we 
do understand what the cost of these mitigations may be, and in, indeed, you know, you know the, the 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 challenges around funding these costs. Have we have you any comments on you know the adoption of the mitigations and the cost implications? Yeah, no problem. So as I've mentioned previously, the 25% reduction scenario was really designed to be representative of I suppose, a Northern Ireland technically feasible reduction scenario. So using existing and validated ammonia reduction strategies um, at uptake rates potentially achievable within five to ten years. So effectively, uh, I'll go through some of the some of the strategies that we modeled. So we modeled the wide, fairly what in fact widespread uptake of, of extended grazing for cattle. So that was 14 days extra per annum for 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 uh, for cattle. Um, the replacement of straight urea with stabilized urea, those were those were uh, at high uptake rates. Um, then we modeled the, a more moderate uptake of low crude protein diets and genetic improvement, both of which obviously contribute to lower nitrogen excretion. Um, the scenario simulates all slurry in Northern Ireland being spread by trailing homes and trailing shoes with a 50-50 split. Other reduction strategies then, for example, housing floor systems, floor covers, uh, they were modeled at lower uptake rates, and that's considerate of the fact that these sort of hard engineered solutions are going to be more costly to implement. So they were that they were modeled at lower uptake rates. Now, in, order, in terms of the costs, um, AFP economists have been develop, developing a number of marginal abatement cost curves for Northern Ireland agriculture in order to determine the cost effectiveness of the ammonia abatement strategies modeled at the national level. And I suppose early indications here suggest that there are a number of low cost strategies which could achieve a significant proportion. Um, of the model of 25% reduction at a low cost or even with cost neutrality. So, for example, extended grazing, low crude protein diets, uh, stabilized urea. These should not require, I suppose, investment in physical infrastructure on the farm. But if we are to achieve more significant reductions, um, you know, we will have to move towards, in particular, the low emission slurry spreading technique, which, which will require physical investments in you know, trailing hose, trailing shoe equipment. And potentially even slurry injection technology, um, if and when those are applicable and our kind of land uh, uh, supports that type of uh, intervention. Now, it's particularly important, um, that's particularly important to have that end of line technique because, because slurry spreading is at the end of the manure management chain. Um, the reductions that we achieve in ammonia throughout the manure management chain, if we don't have that end of line technique in place, for example, you know, emissions that we have prevented through increased scraping or covering of stores. Um, or, or new flooring systems would be partially lost if the end of line technique is not in place. So it's, it's fundamental to have that end of line technique in place. And, and John, maybe there's a few questions coming in here around, um, you know, the impact of some of those mitigations. Which which are the most effective mitigations? And you know, there's another question then. Maybe if you want to take us on into any novel new mitigations that are coming through. And if you were building a new beef house today. What would you do? You're a new cattle house today. What would you do? So, you know, which, what would you do if you were a farmer out there, maybe, um, with regards to mitigations? Well, I know that uh, you know we have started to see. Uh, if you were starting from new, you know, you would, you'd, you'd put in uh, if you if you could um, low emission uh, flooring systems in the house, the systems which have grooves in the floor and um, which can drain the urine more rapidly from the floor surface. It avoids the pooling of urine. Um, on the floor surfaces from which the ammonia emissions, significant ammonia emissions are actually der derived, gets the, 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 the urine into the tank much more quickly. That's, that's a very significant one. Uh, it's costly to retrofit, but if you're starting and if you're building a new house, you know, that would be, uh, it would be very beneficial to have that type of system in place. In terms of more novel, um, I suppose, systems, in terms of the best available currently, I suppose the most, currently the most effective solution for ammonia abatement um, and there's been a lot of research, a lot of uh, evidence in the literature, uh, would be slurry acidification. And scientific studies here have widely reported reductions in ammonia emissions up to 80 percent. And th the likes of this approach has gained popularity, for example, in Denmark and Germany and some of the Baltic states with both um, in-house slurry acidification and also in field slurry acidification. Now, in Northern Ireland, because of our climate and our soils and our management practices, we do have widespread issues with low soil pH. Um, so we would need to really carefully consider the soil health ramifications before I suppose, backing this as a long-term strategy. Now it's, it's clear that additional alignment will be required to offset the slurry that's being acidified to say pH 5.5 or pH, pH 6. And we've determined that this would be approximately, depending on the slurry and the quantity of, of acid applied to that, it would be approximately 50 to 75 kilos of lime per hectare. So it's not a huge amount of extra lime that, that would need to be applied, but we really need to consider the soil health ramifications. Um, on the soil biology uh, before really being able to, to, to I suppose, to, to fully back this, um, this, this system or this, uh, this approach. Now, 
I know from being in contact with, with um, other researchers and industry that there are a range of potentially novel systems on the horizon. Um, so significant research is being carried out, in fact, in Northern Ireland into ammonia absorption nanotechnologies. And this could potentially be adapted for use, for example, in livestock housing or with AD systems. Um, and then I think where really Northern Ireland could really benefit would be in the development of maybe a, a shallow slurry injection technology, which could be adapted to our topography or soils. The systems currently on the market are more suited to your flat, friable soils than they would be to our drumlin type landscape with stony soils. So um, shallow injection will give us significant further reductions over trading holes and trading shoe systems. So I know that Northern Ireland has a very, a very strong agri-engineering sector and possibly this is a, a challenge for them to take on. Okay, thank you, John. Um, maybe just a, in the last couple of minutes, one last question, um, which is again coming through in a bit of a theme. Um, you know, we, what's your thoughts around the, the challenge that we're facing? Um, is this a generational piece? Is it more than even a couple of generations? Um, but where are we going to be in the next 10 years, 20 years with regards to ammonia emissions, or where could we be? And what you know, where do we, what impact could that have on our natural habitats? Well, Obviously, an excellent start, absolutely, to uh, to improving our natural habitats um, and to increasing our nitrogen use efficiency on farm. Okay, John. John, I think we're going to move on there, folks. And thank you very much for your questions. And I realise there's a number of questions in there that we haven't been able to take. But as I say, we'll capture those and correspond with you um, specifically on on your individual questions. So thank you very much, John. And you know, as John was alluding. There is a huge programme of work underway with, with, with regard to ammonia and it's funded by the Department of Agriculture. So we're working very closely with the Department of Agriculture um, in the communication of the results from that. And indeed, I'm sure there'll be lots more results coming out in the coming months um, with regards to the work that John has been undertaking along with our colleagues in CEH and Rothamsted Research. So thank you very much, John. Um, and now we're going to move over to Dario Fornara. Dario, who I was chatting earlier, is a le world leading expert really in the area of soil carbon sequestration. And this morning, Dario is going to give us a little bit of an insight into his results that he's finding with regards to the ability of soils to sequester carbon um, under grassland management and forestry. And then hopefully, Dario will also give us an indication of what that contribution could make. To Northern Ireland achieving net zero or how much more we might need to do to achieve net zero. So, John, I hope, or Dario, I hope you're ready. Are you okay? Uh, uh, yeah, we, it looks like it's fine. Thank you, Dario. So, over to you. Well, um, thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you all online for attending this first um, AFB webinar today. Um, so, my presentation is clearly divided in two different parts. In the first one, I'll bring evidence of my research um, work on soil carbon sequestration, mainly across agricultural grasslands in Northern Ireland, but I'll briefly touch on um, agroforestry as well. The second part of my presentation will be addressing how carbon sequestration in grasslands and in forests can help offsetting greenhouse gas emissions from the land use um, and forestry sector. So I know there is quite a lot of uncertainty related to what extent carbon sequestration can actually um, contribute reducing the carbon footprint of farming systems in Northern Ireland. And I'd like to spend a few words at the end of my presentation um, on what we should be doing going forward in order to reduce this um, uncertainty. So if you look at the um, carbon sequestration potential 
across terrestrial ecosystems in Northern Ireland, I like to focus on agricultural grasslands, um, mainly because, um, well, grasslands um, are a key land use. They cover about 60% of the land area in Northern Ireland and are ecologically and economically very important. 70% of these um, grasslands are classified as improved and very likely receive uh, more than 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, combining inorganic and organic nitrogen forms. Um, in general, it is also estimated that there are 800,000 um, hectares of improved grasslands across Northern Ireland, which is actually sheer number of um, grasslands. So the key question here is um, then how much carbon and how fast we could um, sequester this carbon in improved grassland soils? Well, the answer is not an easy one because it depends on the interaction between different factors, including climate, soil type, and management. So I have underlined um, management here because in the next three slides, I'm going to bring evidence on how um, common management practices could actually influence soil carbon stocks and rates of soil carbon accumulation um, in grasslands. If we look at findings from previous studies across Europe over the last 20 years, um, well, there is evidence that actually grasslands can act as um, sinks for atmospheric CO2. Uh, the problem is there is quite um, a huge variability in rates of soil carbon sequestration, which could go from 0.05 to 0.8 tons of carbon per hectare per year. So this is why it is very important that we need to try to find out how management is responsible for these um, rates variability associated with soil carbon sequestration. So if we look at um, management effects on soil carbon sequestration, I like to start with one um, of the most common agricultural practices, which is um, nutrient fertilization. So here we have <clears throat> a long-term um, grassland experiment established at um, Hillsborough in 1970 after a plow and reseeding event. So these um, experimental plots, they've been receiving very different rates and types of fertilization over the last, well, almost 50 years now. So we go from control, so plots not receiving any nutrients, to NPK applications at the rate of about 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, and then three different levels of to um, different animal um, slurries, pig and cattle. So altogether, we have eight different nutrient treatments, and each of them is replicated eight times. Um, so if we go to look at some of the key findings, you can see the graph just below um, this picture. So this graph shows how soil carbon stocks changed between 1970 and 2013. And the figures are in tons of carbon per hectare. So there are two key messages from this graph. Um, the first one is that all these soils, regardless of um, nutrient fertilization treatment, have been increasing soil carbon stock. So it looks like these soils, they haven't reached a carbon saturation level, even almost after 50 years since the, um, the, the receding event. Um, the second finding is that we found more um, larger soil carbon stocks associated with higher levels of um, cattle slurry applications. So these findings were confirmed um, more recently by another study, uh, which also show um, that soil carbon stocks and rates of soil carbon sequestration are actually um, increasing, especially under applications of um, cattle, medium and high cattle applications, basically. 
um, rates of carbon sequestration between 0 and 20 centimeter depth um, can vary between uh, 0.3 to 0.9 tons of carbon per hectare um, per year. So I was actually waiting for another red circle to come up, but it doesn't want, so I go ahead. Um, moving from nutrient fertilization, uh, the next, um, let's say, very common management practice across grasslands in Northern Ireland is tillage and reseeding. Um, the, the current view here is that if we disturb the soil by plowing, then we're going to increase microbial mineralization of organic carbon, which is then associated with a loss of carbon from soils, which is seen in an increase of CO2 emissions from uh, these soils. Um, we don't know, however, whether these short-term changes, uh, short-term carbon losses, due to uh, plowing, for example, are then reflected in long-term changes in soil carbon stocks. Um, so to test this idea and find out more, a few years ago we selected 126 grasslands across Northern Ireland, um, mainly based on the frequency of receding of these individual grassland fields. So if you look at the picture, um, the red numbers tell us um, how frequently each of these grassland fields has been reseeded over the previous 50 years. So if you look at 4.5, it means that particular field has been reseeded every four and a half years, or nine every nine years in the previous 50 years. So if you go down now to um, <clears throat> the graph, on the x-axis of this graph, we have the <coughs> frequency of receding. Um, so if you move from left to right, you move from very young grasslands on the left, which have been receded more frequently um, every few years. And if you go to the right, you go towards grasslands which have never been receded over the previous 50 years, so permanent grasslands. So according to well, this kind of common view of soil disturbance, we would expect um, an increase in soil carbon stocks um, towards the more permanent grasslands. But actually, we, we didn't find this. Um, and uh, we found basically no differences in soil carbon stocks um, between young and uh, older grasslands. And this was true actually at different um, soil depth layers. Um, at the moment, we have another uh, DERA-founded project to look more into detail. And actually, we selected um, more than 500 grasslands, again, across Northern Ireland, um, with the same intention, to look at receding frequency effects on carbon stocks. And the preliminary results um, seems to confirm um, the fact that actually um, the frequency of receding is not affecting carbon stocks, which is probably a good news because um, it would be easier to maintain or improve carbon stocks in grasslands than actually lose um, this carbon storage. So now it doesn't move forward. Um, see whether we can go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So I wanted to show this one, um, well, to show two key findings from a long-term um, agroforestry experiment um, established at Lock Goal in 1989. Um, in this case, we compared soil carbon stocks and the carbon pool of different soil physical fractions among three different land uses, a permanent grassland, a, an agroforestry system, and a woodland. So the woodland and the agroforestry systems were planted with ash trees. So what we found after 26 years since the conversion of the permanent grassland into um, agroforestry and woodland, we found no significant differences in um, soil carbon stocks across these three land uses. And you can see in the top right graph, there is evidence that there is um, 
um, maybe larger carbon stocks in grasslands, but this is not um, significant. If you look at the graph below, um, this is even more interesting because we found that the carbon um, content, well, the carbon pool of um, the smallest of the soil physical fractions, the silt and clay fraction, is actually significantly higher under the agroforestry and the woodland system, at least between 0 and 10 centimeter soil depth. So this means that this carbon in these systems planted with trees could be more resilient, more recalcitrant. It could be locked longer in the soil, maybe compared to um, the carbon in, um, in grasslands. So I think um, at this stage, given the time um, available, I have provided evidence that there is carbon sequestration potential in grassland soils, but also in soils from agroforestry and woodland systems. Um, the question is then, how much of total greenhouse gas emissions from the land use and forestry sector could be offset by um, the carbon sink of this soil? So to answer this question, um, we try to go into the second part of my presentation. I keep clip, um, clicking this, see if it goes ahead. I guess there are too many people probably online. <clears throat> um, let me see. Okay, this comes up now. Um, so, well, in the meantime, so the second part of my presentation is basically um, related to the UK greenhouse gas inventory and on how um, the inventory has been actually accounting for greenhouse gas emissions associated with the, the land use um, and land use change forestry sector. Um, I'll just wait a second because we it looks like we got stuck here. Okay, here we are. Um, so I was saying that actually in order to find out more about the carbon sequestration potential to offset greenhouse gas emissions, we need to look at the UK greenhouse gas inventory. And we need to find out how this inventory is basically accounting for um, greenhouse gas emissions from the land use, land use change, and forestry sector, namely Lulu CF. So I want to focus on the Lulu CF because um, this sector estimates, um, for instance, how changes in grassland management or changes in land use types which involve grasslands will affect. Um, greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the um, diagram on the left side inside, this um, is just to give you an idea of how um, different land use categories, including grasslands, croplands, forest, and settlement, may change through time. And it is the transitions between these different land categories which are then used by the Lulu CF to estimate greenhouse gas emissions based on specific assumptions and on outputs from um, model calculations. But the point I want to make it here <clears throat> is actually shown um, in the graph on the right side. So when um, the net balance of all these transitions across the different land categories is actually positive for Northern Ireland, which means that Northern Ireland is a net emitter of about 500,000 um, tons of CO2 annually, according to the Lulu CF. So I, I think this is not actually good enough, and we need to find out <clears throat> how we can actually improve greenhouse gas mitigation within the Lulu CF sector. So basically what we need to do, we need to reduce the length 
of this red arrow on the right and possibly invert the trend as shown by the green arrow and making the Ludo CF sector uh, changing from a source um, into like a sink of atmospheric CO2. So this might be possible, but the key issue here is <clears throat> the lack of experimental data, especially long-term data in uh, relation to changes in carbon stocks in soils and in forest biomass. And this is actually a problem for all the UK, not only for Northern Ireland. So if we try and make more detailed predictions um, for Northern Ireland, um, the uncertainty related to carbon sequestration potential of grasslands and forests will remain significant until uh, new knowledge becomes available. I have tried anyway, and I want to show you these two different examples on the carbon sequestration potential of grasslands and forests based on current knowledge. Um, so if we look at um, starting with grasslands, and if we look at the land category, which is called grassland, remaining grassland within the Lulu CF sector, um, basically um, the Lulu CF estimates that these grasslands actually act as a sink of CO2, which is good news, um, of about 750,000 tons um, of CO2 per year. Um, so now, based on, uh, let's say, evidence that we have been gathering from long-term experiments from agricultural grasslands across Northern Ireland, it seems that under, under um, Irish climate conditions, which um, are actually moist and cool, and given the fact that many, well, most of these improved grasslands receive significant additions of inorganic nitrogen, then we can actually um, think that the carbon sequestration potential of these grassland soils down to um, 30 centimeter depth, so in the top soils between 0 and 30 centimeter depth, could be similar to 1.5 tons of CO2 per hectare per year, which is about um, 400 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year. And if we spread this rate of carbon sequestration across this sheer number of um, grassland hectares in Northern Ireland, 800,000, then we could assume that um, carbon sequestration potential in this soil could be as much as 1.2 million tons of um, CO2. So this is a potential which is actually greater than what is currently proposed by the Ludo CS. So at the moment though, we, we don't know whether actually these 800,000 um, hectares of grasslands are sequestering um, on average uh, 0.4 tons of carbon per hectare per year. That's why we need more data. And also because you know different um, it depends on different environmental factors, including again management. Because if we introduce um, soil compaction, for example, these carbon sequestration rates could be reduced. Um, moving to forests, um, so if we consider two different forest land categories within the Lulu CS let's say forest land remaining forest and grassland being converted to forest, um, then the Ludo CF predicts at the moment that Northern Ireland has a sink of just about 600,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So now based on, um, let's say if we assume that 900 hectares of new forest will be planted every year from now to 2050, as partly suggested by the Committee on Climate Change, but also in line with the initiative of the Agriculture Minister um, of about planting 18 million trees over the next 10 years. And 
if we assume that these forests are going to sequester 11 tons of CO2 per hectare per year, which is about three tons of carbon per hectare per year, combining um, timber and soil based on evidence published almost like more than 20 years ago, then we can assume that we can reach this carbon sequestration potential of 1.5 million tons of CO2 by 2050, which is again higher than what has been uh, currently predicted by the Lulucy F. So there are a few caveats here because um, how do we make sure that we sequester this amount of carbon in forest every year? It is difficult to say because um, you know, age, there is an age class legacy. Forests planted now will be maybe sequestering that amount in 30 years from now. Also, we need to keep a, a large proportion of forests like big enough to keep helping sequestering carbon in the meantime. Um, so because this is actually as um, practical implications for land use and management, we made a few calculations on the back um, on the envelope. So basically, let's say we assume that we're going to have 27,000 hectares of forest by 2050, um, which means that we need to kind of sacrifice some of grassland um, land to forest. So in this case, the area of planting required per farm for farms larger than 10 hectares will be 1.4 hectare. Um, taken perhaps from um, grassland. So if we did that, then the required grass yield improvement per hectare to maintain average productivity after planting, it would be 0.31 tons of dry matter per hectare per year, which is probably not uh, a big deal. Um, so going to, the, to, to my second last slide, um, here I just wanted to summarize then what we have been um, finding through these um, calculations on potential carbon sequestration um, in Northern Ireland. So um, the, the, the yellow bar shows what the LUDCF is currently predicting, which is about 500,000 tons of CO2 uh, per year. And the potential in the green bar associated with, um, again, potential carbon sequestration in soils, in grassland soils, and in forest, including forest biomass, is actually showing um, that the LUDOC CF sector could become a net sink in Northern Ireland of almost 900,000 um, tons of CO2 per year. So if we want to stretch this prediction even further, we can say that if we include um, carbon sequestration in grasslands, forests, and edge rows, which probably cover about um, 17,000 hectares in, in Northern Ireland, then perhaps we could get to um, an offset greenhouse gas offset potential of 20%. So I would see this figure, 20%, as a sort of like achievable target. But again, this figure could change quite a lot. Uh, for different reasons. Um, one reason is that we need to look at some of the calculations made within the LULUCF because I've noticed, for example, the cropland in Northern Ireland are associated with very high greenhouse gas emissions, which might not be the case, and which actually could increase that 20%. On the other side, looking at carbon sequestration potential, um, I have included here, um, you know, potential rates of accumulation. But if we include potential losses, for example, from the drainage of organic soils, uh, peat extraction, that is going to reduce this 20%. Um, finally, to conclude, I'd just like to um, spend a few words on what we should be doing going forward if, you really, if we are really uh, serious to um, um, estimate changes in soil carbon stocks through time. So what we need is a comprehensive approach, which is based on credible and reliable um, monitoring, reporting, and verification platform. Very briefly, so what we need, we need to establish long-term experiments at benchmark sites, either across the landscape or within farmlands. 
we need to establish short-term experiments which are useful to test ideas and hypotheses on how specific practices, let's say agricultural liming or the introduction of multi-species worts can actually affect carbon dynamics in the soils. We need to um, have long-term soil surveys where we go back to the same place after five or 10 years and we re-measure uh, carbon stocks to see whether there has been any change. And finally, we need to feed this data into um, existing models and um, validate these models and find out which one of them is best in, in, in predicting long-term changes in soil carbon stock. So to achieve all of this, I think we need um, synergy. We need um, government, public institutions, multiple stakeholders sit down and plan and implement this long-term carbon sequestration monitoring plan in order to really reduce the uncertainty related to the contribution of soil carbon sequestration to greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland. And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take um, questions. Thank you very much, Dario. You took us through that very thoroughly, and um, apologies for the glitches. Um, yeah, it's strange. We're, we're learning. Um, thank you. Um, I do realise we've overran a little bit. Um, I think some of the questions that came through you perhaps answered uh, as you went through your slides, but maybe just one question that has come in, and it's around um, it's around the microbiome of the soil and the interaction with carbon stocks. And maybe a specific question around that is, you know, what could possibly the impact of reseeding affect, you know, the microbiome and the, its mineralization in the soil, you know, as, as a result of um, reseeding? Well, when you when you plow and, and and reseed, I guess at the same time, well, you disturb the soil and you add nutrients. So the microbes probably they get too much excited and they start working faster, and they release some of the CO2 back to the atmosphere but also they might increase in, in, in biomass. So we haven't looked specifically at microbial responses to plowing, but the system is actually accelerating a bit. There is more carbon loss in the, in, in the short term, but there are many other things happening. So carbon is more processed in the soil, and some of this carbon is going to stay in the soil um, probably for a long time. And then there is the role of roots, you reseed, you got more grasses, and the roots of these grasses probably contribute also to carbon inputs um, to the soil. This is something that we haven't looked specifically, um, but we have now in the long-term experiment that I just showed before, where we did do a plow and reseeding event, and we have been following changes in the microbial community. Okay. Okay, Daria, I think we have overran a little bit, um, so we'll maybe not take any more answers or questions, but we have questions, as I said earlier, and we will respond to individuals respectively. Thank you very, very much, Dario, for a very informative talk and for giving us an insight into potentially, you know, the role of grassland and carbon sequestration in grassland and forestry and hedgerows to potentially offset greenhouse gases from, from our agricultural systems. Um, Thank you to all 153 of you that were online this morning. I'm really delighted with the numbers that have participated. I hope you find it of value and we've enjoyed delivering it for you. And uh, we're hoping to continue these, uh, these webinars in the coming months um, in this new world that we're living in. And our next webinar is planned for the 18th of June at 10 o'clock. And that webinar will focus on the future of dairy production to 2030. So Dr. Conrad Barris um, will talk a little bit about silage quality, milk quality, and environmental challenges and, and opportunities in the future to address those. And then Debbie McConnell will also present on grassland management and the potential impact that climate change could well have on our grasslands here in Northern Ireland. So thank you everybody for participating. Um, thank you to Dario and John for your inputs, which have been extremely um, informative. Thank you to the, the background team in our comms and IT department for actually making this happen. Um, I think it all went very well and I'm very grateful for that. So until the 18th, hopefully we'll see most of you again on the 18th of June for our 
future of jade production webinar but for now thank you and have a good day bye bye